So we'd like to welcome everyone to this session titled Poking, Prodding and Purging, The Final Reservoir Frontier. I'm Damien Purcell from Melbourne in Australia and my co-chair is Yachi Ho from the United States. Our first presenter uh, is uh, Wen Kang from China. He's an associate professor and physician at uh, Tangdu Hospital, affiliated with the 4th Military Medical University and he's been a visiting scholar at University of Hawaii. Uh, from 2012 to 2014. His presentation uh, is titled Chinamide Reactivates and Diminishes Latent HIV-1 DNA in Patients on Suppressive Antiviral Antiretroviral Therapy. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Wen Kang, a clinician from Tangdu Hospital. Uh, I'm very glad to come to Amsterdam. Uh, be it's really a beautiful city. And it's my honor to stand uh, to present our study on behalf of Dr. Yung Tao Sun. Well, as we know, uh, antiretroviral therapy has turned <laughs> HIV infection into a treatable illness. However, Antiretroviral therapy is not curative due to the persistence of latent provirus in lung life cells. A proposed strategy to purge the latent reservoir is the so-called shock and kill or kick and kill strategy. The first step, well, first step is using latency reversing agents to reactive uh, provirus transcription. And then latently infected cells would be killed through boosting immune system Meanwhile, new infection is prevented in the presence of antiretroviral therapy. Uh, the common use of the latency reversing agent is histone deacetylase inhibitor. Some clinical trials about this HDAG inhibitor has been done. And these <laughs> agents are generally well tolerated, <coughs> uh, such as Volrinosta and uh, Romidepsin, and uh, et cetera. However, so far, none of these agents alone were powerful enough to uh, reduce the reservoir size. Uh, previously, studies have confirmed that histone deacetylase inhibitor could induce HIV messenger RNA transcription in latently infected resting CD4 cells in vivo, but their activity is variable. Uh, Chitamide is a low nanomolar HDAG inhibitor of benzamide class. It was developed by a Chinese company and first licensed in China in 2015, which was used in relapsed and uh, refractory peripheral T cell lymphoma. It was the most active listen, uh, latency reversing agent in primary cell screening model. In this study, we conducted a phase 1b and 2a clinical trial to evaluate the safety and the efficiency of chitamide in combination with antiretroviral therapy in HIV-infected adults with suppressed uh, viral load to reverse HIV latency. That's the uh, clinical trial design. Uh, this was a non-randomized intervention, interventional trial 10 microgram ketamide was given orally twice a week on Tuesday and Friday for totally four weeks. The HIV patients on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, um, at least more than 18 months was included in this uh, trial. The HIV RA was um, um, lower than 50 copies per milliliter and the CD4 T cells counts were more than 350 cells per micro, uh, milliliter. So the red, red point showed the each, dose, each dosing of ketamide. And the, the plasma concentration of ketamide were mirrored at multiple time points after the first and the last dose showed as the right, uh, uh, the green <coughs> points. 
that's the baseline characteristics of the all the participants. Uh, there are six males and one female completed eight oral doses of ketamide. Ketamide was well tolerated. Only two of seven participants were reported adverse events, which are rash, fatigue, and somnolence. Complete blood cells, especially for red blood cells counts, and uh, hemoglobin is a, slightly, a slight decrease and recovered at day 56. A CD40 cell count was stable during the study period. No serious adverse events were reported. That's the PK and the PD profile of the medicine. The upper finger showed the PK and the, the lower finger shows the PD figure shows the PD profile. The figure A shows the uh, plasma concentration of ketamide after the first and the last dose. The blue line uh, is the single dose concentration and the red line is the multiple dose concentration. Uh, this figure shows the, tr the trough plasma concentration. And the figure C shows the relative change of histone 3 and histone 4 acylation in uh, CD40 cells after the first dose. The last figure shows the relative change of histone acylation levels. These are the calculate PK uh, parameters. And taken together, we confirm that the dosing regimen of twice a week could induce post-drug exposure and the cyclic increases of histone acylation levels. More importantly, we proved that ketamide could reduce HIV transcri transcription. As an intracellular marker of HIV RNA transcription, we detect cell-associated associated HIV RNA. The left figure is the cell-associated uh, HIV RNA levels, and the right finger is the relative change. We did not find a significant increase at the initial doses, but as time proceeded, the changes become pronounced and peaking at the last two doses. We also intensively detected plasma HIV RNA after every dose. We can see that the plasma viral rebound in all participants after the first dose. And this quantifiable plasma HIV RNA was repeatedly detected following the subsequent dosing. All participants had at least one plasma viral load of more than 100 copies per milliliter. And the two patients had at least one plasma viral load of more than 1,000 especially in the patient uh, in the uh, patient number five, as to show the yellow line. The plasma uh, viral load remained quantifiable throughout, throughout of all, uh, all of eight doses. The plasma HIV RNA recovered undetectable at the day uh, 56. In conclusion, the dynamic of cell-associated HIV RNA and the plasma HIV RNA demonstrated ketamide could induce a cyclic and a re robust latency reversal. Then we used the PCR-based assay to measure the latent reservoir. Uh, we detected total HIV DNA and cell number. We found a significant decrease in cell-associated HIV uh, DNA from baseline to day 27 and uh, day 56, which is nearly half percent and 40% uh, decrease, respectively. Meanwhile, we also detected uh, 15 inflammatory uh, biomarkers. And uh, the figure shows that only the, the six biomarkers, which has changed at least uh, one decrease from the baseline. Uh, they are MCP1, MMP9, uh, IP10, LBP, P selecting, and the CD4, CD40L.
Furthermore, we also found a decreasing trend in the population of CD4 T cells, if uh, CD4 T cells expressing PD1. From uh, day 15 to day 56. So, uh, this finding shows maybe a kid might exhibit immune modulator effects. Conclusion Our study proved that kid might was safety for HIV patients who are receiving antiretroviral therapy. And it is uh, it could disrupt HIV latency, resulting in a cyclic plasma viremia and the further reduction of viral reservoir. However, the participant was limited, only seven, and no control group was set up. To validate this finding, a multiple center randomized clinical trial incorporating 60 participants is ongoing. At last, we must thank we must give our appreciation to all the study participants, and we must uh, thank uh, Chip Screen for providing study ketamide tablets. And we also thank Guangzhou Super Biotechnic and, uh, for their detecting, uh, detecting uh, HIV RNA and uh, cell-associated HIV DNA. Uh, these are our research team and the clinical team. And in the middle, is, uh, this is our director, Dr. Yong Tao Sun. And uh, this is the first house of the, uh, the presentation, uh, Dr. Li Jianhui. OK, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. This paper is open for questions. Presentation. I, I wonder how you reconcile the different pharmacodynamics of the three effects you presented. It appeared that the effect on acetylation occurred early, the effect on um, cell associated RNA occurred late, and the effect on plasma HIV RNA was seen throughout the uh, study. So those three seem disparate, and how do you reconcile that? Yes, it's a really a good question. But uh, we're just finding this uh, phenomenon. But uh, I. Uh, I think there did not correlation between the cell associated RNA and the plasma RNA. I don't know why. But also the acetylation effect seemed to be very early, but you don't see an effect on cell associated RNA until very late. Yeah, I, I, I also don't know what's the reason. Maybe the numbers was limited. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, it looked to me that the individuals that had the really big responses had larger reservoirs at baseline. I was wondering whether you've looked at the fold change in response and how much transcription or how large the reservoir is at baseline. So the orange, the, the, the sort of orange line at the top. Uh, from that one finger, which, uh, one finger, we can show the the baseline uh, reservoir. Yeah, there was a relationship with the response to chitamide and the size of the baseline reservoir. Mm. One figure shows the baseline reservoir. The uh, I, I can't remember. Can back? <coughs> yeah. This is number five, the baseline reservoir. Yeah, so my question was, you may not have done the analysis, but was there a relationship between the baseline reservoir so that this sort of um, camel-coloured line and the response to chitamide. It would be an interesting analysis to look at. I don't think you've done it. You didn't show it, but it would be an interesting analysis. And I, I, I might have missed, how long were people on antiretroviral therapy for before enrolment, and what antiretrovirals were they on? I just missed that. At least 18 uh, months. And which drugs? Atripla, was it? Or mm. PIs? That's okay. the, the drug resume. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome our next speaker. Um, Dr. Yuri Simons is from the Doherty Institute from University of Melbourne. He's an early career fellow. The title of his talk is 
the antiretroviral CCR5 inhibitor Merevibrac effectively reverses HIV latency by phosphorylation of the kappa B. Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present our data on uh, antiretroviral CCR5 inhibitor, which uh, also acts as a latency reversal agent. So I have nothing to disclose. So as we all know, the major hurdle to HIV remission is the presence of latently infected cells that infect uh, long-lived cells or cells that proliferate without inducing transcription of um, antiretrovirals. And as explained earlier, one potential strategy is the shock and kill strategy, which uh, aims to induce transcription and thereby um, presenting these cells to the um, immune system and um, induce uh, killing. However, currently latency reversal agents are either not potent enough, do not induce cell death, or have significant toxicity, so one can't increase the concentration, and even in some settings, they um, impair cell-mediated immunity, so they hamper death. So new LRAs are urgently warranted that have a good safety profile, and Maravirok might be one of them. So the CSA5 antagonist Maravirok has been shown to increase unspliced AGV RNA in vivo and in vitro, and in infected individuals on ART in a single uh, arm observational study by activating NF-kappa-B, so potentially acting as a C5 agonist. Maravirok would be a potentially attractive LRA since it's non-toxic, has a good safety profile, and is approved antiretroviral agent. Um, so it can block uh, the virus that it shocks out of latency. But its relative potency compared to other LRAs remains unknown. So our hypothesis was that the CC5 inhibitor Maravirok has a greater potency as a latency reversal than other commonly used LRAs in vitro and in vivo. And our aims were to determine whether intensification with Maravirok in HIV-infected individuals leads to latency reversal in shown in increased cell-associated HIV RNA, and to determine the fact how uh, latency is reversed uh, by Maravirok, and compare the effects of Maravirok to other, other LRAs on HIV transcription ex vivo using CD4 T cells from HIV infected individuals on ART. So, the first aim we uh, set out to do this in a sub study of the Maravirok immune recovery study. This trial was a randomized placebo controlled double blind clinical trial and recruited 85 patients. These were all immune non-responders at a low CD4 count. And they were randomized in two groups, placebo or Maravirok, and uh, subsequent uh, samples were drawn over four to eight weeks of trial to determine um, the effect of Maravirok intensification on immune reconstitution. However, uh, no effect was observed in this trial. So we did a small sub-study this, from this trial, 15 patients, five on placebo, 10 on and Maravirok, we selected patients based on sample availability <coughs> and tropism in the Maravirok uh, group. And we uh, uh, assessed effects on baseline week two and week eight. We did this by extracting PBMCs and looking in these PBMCs on levels on unspliced HIV cell-associated RNA and kappa B regulated genes by droplet digital PCR and we looked at plasma on CCR5 uh, ligands by Luminex. So we had 15 patients, the median age was around 55, they were all male at a low CD4 count, about 170 since they were immune non-responders. They were target non-detected as baseline, so no viral load. The ACE on treatment was about six and they were undetectable for about five. So when we look at latency reversal, we look at relative HIV RNA expression uh, relative to gap dh and B2M. And we look at cell-associated HIV RNA, and in blue we see placebo, and in orange we see Maravirok, and in placebo it um, tends to go down, and Maravirok tends to go up. However, this was not significant within the group, and there was a strong trend in difference between the groups. When we look at a full change over baseline, <coughs> Uh, from week eight, we see that uh, there is a significant difference in induction between Maravirok uh, group and placebo, with Maravirok going up. So since Maravirok um, binds CCR5 and thereby inhibiting uh, R5 virus, tropic virus, 
we determine tropism of our patient population of the Maravro group by bulk uh, population sequencing. So we extract the DNA from PBMCs and sequence the variable loop 3, which is the main determinant in um, tropism um, usage. And we predicted tropism in silico by using Genotofino. So we had five R5s in Maravrog and five X4s. And what we see is that the induction of um, transcription and full change over baseline is relatively the same in both R5 and X4s. And the uh, uh, highest full change in baseline is in the X4s. So these are population-based sequencing. So since Maravrog binds the Kim carnes after CCL5, we wondered what happened to these ligands, the natural ligands of CCL5. So we looked at run test MIP1 alpha, MIP1 beta, uh, picograms per milliliter by Luminex, and we see that run test MIP1 alpha, there's no change and no difference between placebo and Maravrock. However, there is um, a strong trend in difference induction in MIP1 beta with a full change of about 2.3, which is also observed in another clinical trial of Maravrock intensification by Peter Hunt, where um, they saw a 2.5 fold <laughs> induction of MIP1 beta by Maravrock. So induction of MIP1 beta uh, could lead to an increased expression of cytokines. And uh, so we looked at NF-kappa-B regulated uh, cytokines, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, IL-6, and IL-10, a full change of a baseline at week 8. This was done by uh, Droplet Digital. And what we see is that in interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, and IL-6, it goes down in placebo where it goes up in Maravrock, and this uh, difference in full change is significant. So Maravrock seems to induce NF-kappa-B regulated gene expression. So we wondered if this was a direct effect of Maravrock. So what we did, um, um, ex vivo, so we took uh, total CD4 cells uh, from unaffected patients, incubated this with one micromolar of Maravrock, and lysis cells at different times, and then look at phosphorylated NF-kappa-B by Western blood and analyzed by densitometry. And we did this uh, relative to MOC, and our positive control was PMA inomycin. And already at 15 minutes, you see that uh, there is a significant increase, or significant, sorry, there's a two-fold increase of phosphorylated NF-kappa-B. So, it seems that Maravrock binding to um, CCL5 directly phosphorylates NF-kappa-B. And although it was observed that Maravrock binding to uh, CCL5 doesn't induce calcium flux, it seems to phosphorylate NF-kappa-B. So it might be an agonist instead of an antagonist. So we wondered what the breadth of induction was of Maravrock in um, ex vivo, um, so reversing latency. So from Luca Faris, um, um samples uh, from uh, people living with HIV on ART, so the Luca um, patients in Melbourne, we isolated resting CD4 T cells, uh, 5 million, and we incubated this with two micromolar of Maravrock, which is close to the CMAX in individuals, in the presence of Raltegavir to inhibit subsequent infections, and um, uh, lysis cells, and then we looked at unspliced or multiply spliced HIV RNA by qPCR. And we compared this to um, um, the solvent DMSO where Maravrock is in, and the positive control was PMA PHA, but also to Varinostat, the well known and characterized uh, HTAC1 inhibitor. So if you look at unspliced HIV RNA uh, full change over DMSO, we see that Maravrock uh, significantly increases and reverses latency compared to DMSO uh, treated cells, but also just significant um, is more induction of transcription um, compared to Varinostat. If we then look at uh, multiply spliced, so in unspliced we see a 3.3 fold induction, but in multiply spliced we see a lower induction with Paravrog, just a two fold uh, increase, but still significant over DMSO, where Varinostat doesn't reach significance. So to conclude, Maravrock in vivo and ex vivo leads to an increase in cell-associated unspliced HIV RNA, consistent with latency reversal. And ex vivo, the effect was more potent than Farinostat. However, ex vivo, there was only a modest increase in multiply spliced HIV RNA, suggesting that there are other blocks present uh, that still persist in resting cells 
machines with LRAs. So as previously reported, Maravrock also increases the CCR5 ligand MIP1 beta, which could result in increased cytokine expression. And Maravrock directly phosphorylates NF-kappa B in primary cells and increased expression of genes regulated by NF-kappa B, of which HIV is one. So this may be the potential mechanism of latency reversal. So I propose the following mechanism, how this works. Um, in 2013, uh, Don et al. Um, um, published the uh, crystal structure of C uh, CCR5 bind with Maravrock. And what they showed is that Maravrock binds deep into the binding pocket of CCR5. And there it interacts with a few residues, some of which are important in the uh, binding of the variable loop 3 of the glycoprotein, so inhibiting entry of R5-tropic virus. And this is the antiretroviral effect of Maravrock. But it also is shown to induce uh, of uh, bind to two residues that are important in downstream signaling of the um, natural ligands of CCR5. And this might be um, the anti-latency effect of Maravrock. So one significant limitation of Maravrock is that if the effect is direct, it will only be in CCR5 positive cells, and this needs to be further explored. And although CCR5 positive cells are significantly enriched for HCV, they still might represent only a small portion of the, of the reservoir. So Maravrock should be further explored as an LRA, given its safety profile and acti activity as an antiretroviral. And Maravrock would be interesting to explore in the context of combination latency reversal aging as intensification of ART and shop and kill. And maybe it will be synergistic with um, HTAC. So I'd like to thank uh, the team at uh, PDI and my former employers at Utrecht, and also the funding bodies, and of course, the study participants in uh, Melbourne and uh, the Netherlands. Thank you. Okay, on the here we, we got it now. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My bad. Um, so really quickly, uh, did you see any differences in cell-associated RNA in um, the individuals that had an R5 tropic population versus those that had an X4 tropic population? In levels? Yeah. Um, not really. So it's uh, the fold ch change induction was similar. The uh, X fours had a lower reservoir, mm -hmm. so also the level was a bit lower. And um, but in one it was really high. Okay. So the numbers are that are small, so I can't make a conclusion on that. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Since you um, on the resting CD four experiments on activation of NF kappa B, you see such a strong effect, and CCR five expression is probably going to be really low. Have you considered that your activity as an LRA is an off-target effect of Maraviroc is not related with their binding to CCR5? Um, perhaps um, in 72 hours it might induce a MIP1 beta in that culture. We didn't assess that. And um, this might then bind to other chemokine receptors for maybe CCR7, CCR8. Um, what we do see, though, that it directly phosphorylates and of kappa B. <coughs> and what would be of interest is to sort out CCR5 positive cells and CCR5 negative cells and see if the effect is similar in these groups. I mean, it could be something that is completely unrelated to binding to even a chemokine receptor. So have you, like, look at any other activi uh, activity or any other pathway analysis that it will tell you it's maybe activating something that is not expected. Um, perhaps we haven't, we don't have a system in place to, to assess that. <coughs> Last question. Um, hello. Uh, what what were the concentrations um, in the uh, RNA measurements of the varinostat and the Maravrock? Were they similar or? Um, Sorry, the concentration of Varinostat and... The test, con yeah, test <laughs> concentrations of the ligands. Um, 
Uh, we didn't test the concentration of the liquid. Oh no, I just went did Maravra, was it added at one micromolar in the earlier experiments? Yeah, so the in, the, in the second ex vivo experiment, we used uh, two micromolar because that's close to Cmax. Okay, and the hypothesis is you blocked, but the uh, 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 increased amount of MIP1 beta is what's causing. The, our hypothesis is that it, it binds to CCR5 and directly phosphorylates NF Direct, kappa B. Okay. okay. Mavrox is an inverse agonist, it's, which is an antagonist. So it, it might be linked to inverse agonism or something, something like that. And I'll do, my other question was, have you looked at uh, Senec River Rock, so you block CCR2 as well? That, that might be quite an interesting experiment. Yes, we haven't, but that's good. Um, right. Right, thank you. Our next speaker. Yes, our next speaker will be George Curry from Doherty Institute from University of Melbourne. His talk will be the RNA binding proteins SRP14 and HMGB3 play a crucial role in controlling HIV replication and latency. So thanks, Yachi. So hi, everyone. First, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the chance to present the work that we've been doing. So I don't have any conflict of interest to declare, potentially except that maybe Damien Purcell is my boss on this panel. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, as previous, so as earlier mentioned by Yuri, many of the latency reversing agents that have been considered for purging the latent reservoir correspond to inducers of the NFKPB pathway. Unfortunately, because NFKPB is a master regulator of so many key responses in mammal, side effect will most certainly occur. In addition, Despite the ability of many of the LRAs, such as the HDAC inhibitors, bromodomain inhibitors, to induce HIV transcription in primary model of latency, many of these LRAs, they, they can't induce efficiently HIV transcription in cells from HIV-infected individual on art. So clearly, we need more potent, specific, and innovative approaches to address these issues. So the viral protein has been shown can inhibit the establishment of HIV latency as that feedback is sufficient to control active and latent infection at a higher rate than any of the known LRIs. Because of its central role, in fact, in the transcriptional transactivation and the production of full-length viral mRNA, it is understandable how small stochastic changes in the level of that can induce latency. In fact, it has been shown that HIV latency can arise when the level of TAT fall below a threshold, or following the nuclear retention of multiply splice mRNA that encode TAT in resting CD4 positive T cells. However, despite the presence of these multiply splice transcript in resting CD4 positive T cells, it remains unclear why these cells cannot produce TAT and why the positive feedback loop cannot induce HIV gene expression to the level sufficient for virus production. So in order to determine the factor that affect that expression during latency, we conducted a pull-down assay using the MSRNA as a bait, or TAT mRNA, and a T cell line model of latent infection, so the JLI 6.3 and 10.6. As you all know, these latently infected T cell lines, they produce virus following uh, additional treatment with TNF-alpha. So proteins identified by mass spectrometry were classified based on their abundance, reproducibility, and specificity of each RNA protein interaction over three independent interactions. So at a high cutoff, we identified 228 new binding partners of the MSRNA. So 15 were common to both conditions, and 96 and 132 were specific respectively of the latent and activated cell state. So this screen also identified a number of RNA binding protein, which has been previously shown to bind HIV-1 RNA, as well as factors that has been shown to be enrich in activated and resting CD4 positive T cells. Now, when we classified these factors into subgroup, we noticed an enrichment in host factors involved in mRNA processing and translation. 
So out of these proteins, we've selected 15 uh, factors for a follow-up study, including some known regulators of latent and productive HIV infection, such as PTB1, which has been previously shown by Silicano's group as a HIV RNA binding protein that is differentially expressed between the activated and resting CD4 positive T cells, and is capable of reactivating uh, latently infected cells by inducing the cytoplasmic accumulation of these multiply splice RNA. So in order to study the role of these factors during latency, we use an adapted dual-color HIV reporter virus that is originally built by Eric Vardin group. So it contains an LTR-dependent EGFB and an MTAG BFP2 that is expressed from NEF1 alpha promoter. So this single round HIV reporter virus will allow the distinction of the productively infected cells, so EGFP positive or EGFP and BFP positive, versus the latently infected BFP positive cells. So, so following the knockdown of these uh, selected factors using SSRNA lentivectors, followed by the infection with the dual color reporter virus, revealed a drastic increase in the single BFE positive population, indicative of latent infection following the knockdown of SRP14. Why we notice a significant increase in the EGFE popula population cells, indicative of productive infection following the knockdown of HMGB3. So these changes in the latent and productive infection were coupled with the significant increase in the MS splicing following HMGB3 and PTB knockdown, while SRP14 knockdown was associated with a decrease in MS splicing. In addition, we noticed that SRP14 uh, knockdown led to a significant reduction in TAT translation, transactivation, why HNGB3 induce a significant increase in TAT translation and transactivation. So it's which correlate with the changes observed earlier with latent and productive infection. Now, in order to identify the role of SRP14 in controlling latent infection and virus reactivation, we use an overexpression system where the uh, protein expression is induced by doxycycline treatment. So as we can see, following doxycycline treatment and SRP14 expression, it led to a drastic uh, significant increase uh, of the provirus in all the latently infected T cell line tested. So the JL at 10.6, 8.4, and A2. So all these results suggest that SRP14 might play a role as a positive factor of HIV gene expression. So to test this hypothesis, what we did is we transfected resting CD4 positive T cells from patient on art with SRP14 or PTB uh, inducible expression construct, 48 hours post-transfection. So we use an RT-DDPCR assay to measure the amount of virus that is released in the supernatant of these cultures. So as you can see, following, so the cells that are transfected with SRP14 and PTB led to a specific increase of virus production that is comparable to that seen with following PHA stimulation, and that without inducing global T cell activation. So the ability of SRP14 to induce the production of replication competent virus and this reverse of the latency phenotype, which is the cytoplasmic accumulation of the multiple splice RNA, is being tested right now. So in summary, because of the central role of that in the establishment and maintenance of latency, factors that affect transcription, splicing, cytoplasmic localization, or translation of that, like SRP14 or HMGB3, can modulate or impact on HIV latency. So such factors could be targeted and used as a novel target and more for novel and more specific strategies to clear and activate a bigger proportion of the latent reservoir or to prevent viral reactivation uh, on following CR interruption. So finally, I would like to thank all the people who participated to this work at the Peter Doherty Institute, our collaborators at Monash University, our funding bodies, and mostly the participants of this study.
with that, thank you all for your attention. I have a quick question here. Um, uh, nice, nice talk. So I have a question. The expression of the uh, this factor is uh, is that modulated after T cell activation? Is it a low expression in resting cells, and that is why there is no? In fact, in resting cells, if we could see, we did check it in healthy and active and uh, patients uh, on CR, we could notice that this factor, is, as a protein level, uh -huh. is half log like log 10 reduced compared to activated cells okay. through CD3, CD28, or PMA, PHA. Okay. However, interestingly, the mRNA level is the same. So I don't have it here, but it's- So the, so the protein levels are decreased after activation? No, so no, it's they're... decreased in resting cells. In resting cells. And which then, okay. explains and why, why when you overexpress okay. it, you reactivate these cells. And then just a technical question on your transfection on the patient cells, on your mock transfect. So are you transfecting plasmids to overexpress? Yes, so you mean- uh, No, it's, it's the a, bad so is the mock is just an empty vector? Or, yes, it's bad, but yes. Um, quick question. Uh, great talk. Um, does this um, SRP14 affect cellular splicing? Like, have you have any other uh, cellular RNA examined? Good, good question. We we haven't tested that yet, so we tested only specifically uh, this part. However, in our assay of the MS splicing, we had a control construct, and it had a human part and a virus part and that normalize over it. So it would be interesting to go back and check this part only. You're right. Thinking, I'm thinking you're thinking this is gonna be an LRA that's specific to HIV infected cells because it interacts with TAD. MR, yes. So, um, you know, obviously that's an advantage over other LRAs out there that are so nonspecific, but have you checked to see what SRP14 binds to otherwise? Is there some other stuff that it binds? Yeah, actually SRP14, so it's known as a signal recognition particle, so uh, or a stop, so it allows the directing the protein, the secretory protein to the membrane of the ER. So that's usually its role. However, interestingly, there is a group in Russia that published like a year or two ago about the role of SRP14 in controlling the pull of active ribosome. So it'd be interesting to think potentially or speculate here that because we saw the increase in translation and what they saw about the pool of the ribosome and how it's like pumps the 40S ribosome that potentially SRP14 is directing the ribosome to the mRNA and this is why we're seeing the effect, the activation effect. But it's not done as a protein-protein interaction. Okay, thank you, George. So our next presentation is from Petronella Ankuta. Um, she's presenting a, an abstract titled Using the PPARG Antagonism to Block and Lock HIV Reactivation in TH17 Cells. Okay, good morning everyone. It's really exciting to be part of this uh, session. Um, I would like to present uh, our work today and I'm really, really grateful to the organizers for giving me the, the opportunity to speak. So it's very well established in the field of uh, HIV AIDS that uh, a chronic infection, even in uh, art-treated individuals, is associated with uh, depletion of uh, TH17 cells from uh, gut-associated um, lymphoid tissues. And uh, this uh, alteration leads to uh, an increased permeability of uh, mucosal uh, barrier that uh, allows uh, microbial translocation, uh, which leads to uh, chronic immune activation and disease progression. So as I said, antiretroviral therapy is not efficient enough to restore this immune deficit. And uh, this is the reason uh, in my lab we really focus on identifying new targets in uh, TH17 cells. These cells can be distinguished about, uh, among uh, other CD4 T cells by uh, the expression of specific markers on their surface, such as CCR6. They uh, express HIV coreceptor CD4 and uh, especially CCR5. 
and uh, they are also expressing uh, the integrin alpha for uh, beta 7 at quite high levels, uh, those allowing them to migrate into the gut and other tissues. Uh, uh, studies by our groups, uh, uh, group and others uh, were able to demonstrate that uh, TH17 cells exhibit increased permissiveness to infection. Uh, studies by the group of uh, Thomas Hope demonstrated that during the first 24 hours of infection, TH17 cells are um, the first targets of uh, SIV uh, during vaginal challenge. And um, we were able to demonstrate that during antiretroviral therapy, uh, integrated HIV DNA persists at higher levels in CCR6 positive compared to CCR6 negative uh, T cells from the blood and the colon. So uh, despite their increased permissiveness and the expression of multiple HIV uh, permissiveness factors in these cells, we were able uh, to identify also um, multiple um, transcription factors, including PPAR gamma, that act as an intrinsic a negative regulator of uh, HIV replication in uh, uh, TH17 cells. Uh, this study was published in 2013, and I will not go into details. So uh, by using confocal microscopy, we were able uh, to demonstrate that uh, rosiglitazone, which is a PPAR gamma agonist, uh, promotes a nuclear translocation of PPAR gamma, while in the presence of T007, which is an antagonist, uh, this uh, process of nuclear translocation is prevented. So uh, we hypothesize that PPAR gamma antagonism can be used uh, in AJV reservoir activation strategies. So it is known that uh, PPAR gamma is widely expressed in many cells uh, and many tissues, and it can act uh, at the level of transcription, either by promoting transcription of uh, uh, certain genes or by repressing the transcription of uh, multiple genes, such as uh, NF-kappa-B. And uh, also in uh, studies uh, that uh, were performed in ma uh, mice, uh, demonstrated that uh, PPAR gamma is a transcriptional repressor of uh, ROR gamma T, which is uh, the master regulator of TH17 differentiation. Consistent with these studies in mice, we uh, proved in uh, vitro, uh, using human cells uh, from art-treated individuals, that uh, TCR triggering in the presence of T007 lead to increased uh, IL-17 production in these cells, and rosiglitazone has an opposite effect as expected. We also demonstrated that uh, T007 uh, was associated with increased levels of uh, TATREV messenger RNA in the cells, uh, suggesting that indeed uh, PPAR gamma antagonists will increase HIV uh, uh, transcription. However, when we performed a long term uh, viral outgrowth assay in vitro with cells from our treated individuals, we uh, were surprised to see that both uh, PPAR gamma agonists and antagonists were able to inhibit cell to cell transmission and viral replication in this model. We went into more details and looked at uh, uh, subsets of uh, CD40 cells based on their ability to produce uh, uh, TH17 and TH1 cytokines, and we uh, demonstrated that T007 uh, robustly inhibit uh, HIV replication in TH17 and TH1, TH17 cells, which are the major uh, sites of HIV replication. We also performed in parallel studies in vitro where we infected the CD40 cells with a, a trans, uh, um, transmitted founder strain. And we demonstrated in a dose responsive manner that uh, T007 increased IL-17 production while decreasing HIV replication in vitro. This uh, effect was associated with a um, slight decrease in CCR5 expression. Um, which may explain in part the inhibition, but one can suspect that other post-entry uh, mechanism may be involved in the uh, HIV restriction. So we went to the literature and uh, we found uh, information about uh, how cholesterol derivatives uh, are able to stimulate ROR gamma, uh, ROR, ROR gamma uh, which you, uh, was very uh, no, was known for a very long time as an orphan receptor. So the discovery of these ligands uh, was an important discovery by the group of Dan Littmann. 
Then other groups demonstrated that uh, the der derivatives of cholesterol, for example, the 25-hydroxycholesterol that is generated uh, via an enzyme cholesterol 25 hydrolase, uh, also promotes HIV restriction in uh, primary CD40 cells. So consistent with this uh, data, we uh, demonstrated that uh, in our system, uh, treatment with T007 resulted in increased uh, messenger RNA expression for cholesterol 24, uh, 25 hydrolase. We also demonstrated that exogenous 25 hydroxycholesterol is a potent inhibitor of HIV integration and replication and a promoter of IL-17 production. However, we always like to study cells um, uh, not in a, a bulk uh, because uh, different Th subsets can influence each other, especially Th1 can inhibit Th17 cells. So we like to separate cells in, for example, in CCR6 positive and negative, and uh, with CCR6 positive, including the majority of Th17 cells, and we could demonstrate that uh, uh, T T007 induces preferentially IL-17 and CCR6 positive cells, and there is a reduction of HIV replication in CCR6 positive uh, T cells by T007, as expected. Also, there was a decreased uh, uh, expression of CCR5 on CCR6 positive cells. However, when we looked at uh, the expression of messenger RNA or uh, for uh, cholesterol 25 hydrolase, we saw that this enzyme is expressed only in CCR6 negative cells. So this cannot be uh, the effect of T007 cannot be uh, explained by this enzyme. So uh, we. Uh, Proposed to test a model in which uh, T007 acts at different levels on CCR6 uh, th uh, 17 uh, cells, either by blocking the transcription of genes involved in HIV permissiveness or by uh, uh, inducing uh, genes involved in HIV restriction. So, uh, to get insight into this mechanism, we performed RNA seq analysis and we identified genes that were modulated by T007 in CCR6 positive T cells. We are at the very beginning of understanding this uh, result. What I can say at this point, for the sake of time, is that the top modulated genes include um, cytokines that are uh, associated with TH17 functions, such as IL-21, a very important cytokine that was proved to be uh, provide an advantage by uh, administration in vivo in monkeys. Studies by Mirko Paiardini uh, revealed this. And top-down regulated genes uh, involved, uh, genes such as furin, which is uh, involved in, uh, uh, in uh, virion maturation. So uh, the take-home message from this presentation is that the PPAR gamma antagonists uh, boost TH17 effector functions and uh, promotes uh, HIV transcription, but uh, blocks the cell-to-cell -cell transmission acting at multiple levels. So this study has a fundamental importance uh, in understanding multiple, how we can disconnect transcription from cell-to-cell -cell transmission in, in cells just by acting on a transcription factor. And uh, we hope that in the future, we may be able to extract some uh, meaning for the potential use of this uh, PPAR gamma antagonism as a new therapeutic strategy. So this work was uh, performed in Montreal at the Shum Research Center, uh, mainly by two people in my lab, very talented, Yu Wei Zhang and Delphine Planas. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the people in my lab who contributed to this work. Our collaborators, Nicolas Chaumont and Jean-Pierre Routy. Um, I would like to thank my collaborators in CanCure, which is the Canadian enterprise for HIV cure that is founded by, by the CIHR, uh, CANFAR, and International AIDS Society. Um, and I would like to address a special thank to HIV infected and uninfected study participants. Thank you. Great talk, um, right, right here. One quick question. Um, so PPAR gamma has been used, agonist has been used as a uh, insulin sensitizer in diabetes and then some of the HIV infected individuals may, individuals may have been taking this drug. So what do you think these PPAR gamma agonists may do to HIV transcription? Well, we published in 2013 the inhibitory effect of uh, rosiglitazone on HIV replication. 
uh, in, in this, by blocking HIV transcription. In this case, the PPAR gamma antagonism uh, can uh, allow HIV transcription but will block HIV replication at the other level. So it can act as a, a, sh a shock and uh, kill and uh, block and lock in a way uh, drug. So I, I don't want to be too pretentious in, in claiming so much about this, but the fact that it also promotes TH17 effector functions such as L21 for us is very interesting to, to be able to play and disconnect all these uh, networks, uh, regulatory networks. Hi Petronella, great talk. Um, my, my question is more a philosophical question actually, um, and it's a bit, it, it comes, it's related to Yori's work as well, because you're showing an effect just on CCR6 positive cells, but, and Yori perhaps CCR5 positive cells, but not all the reservoir is in these separate cells. So the reservoir is enriched in CCR6 positive cells, but there will be virus in other populations. So is this a, a good route for us to go down, to be d identifying LRAs that just work in subpopulations? Just so, something to sort of think about as an overall strategy. I'm not it, sure. It, ma it might make things very complicated in the for first us. Part of, uh, the first uh, part of the results were generated with total CD40 cells, okay. and the inhibitory effect is there. So we, uh, and then we perform studies on separated cells. So it acts uh, on CCR6 negative cells dependently on this enzyme, which is cholesterol 25 hydrolase, which is known to be antiviral. So, but in CCR6 positive cells, there are other mechanisms that we are trying to reveal. So I think it acts broadly. Now, I think there is high toxicity. This drug was put on the market to treat metabolic diseases by a company that doesn't exist anymore. So definitely is high toxicity. So, but we can play with yeah. the, the properties of such drugs and all drugs that we use in HIV. Uh, they are toxic and uh, you know, any other diseases, uh, there is no uh, you know, no toxicity at all. So uh, for us, it's, it's really, as I said, a, a fundamental interest to know how to play with these networks, but also we hope that we can have an in, a therapeutic advantage at one point, but it, it requires a lot of investigations. To, right, so, so you're saying it has an effect on HIV in total cells, yes, but does. then you're pursuing no, these specific uh, pathways uh, we, in We want to test it on dendritic cells, on macrophages, uh, you know, to, to try to see how these drugs act on uh, CTL responses and K cell uh, functions so, you know, before you go in vivo, you need to know a lot on uh, the action of, on different immune cells. Great, thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sarah Joseph. She's a uh, um, faculty in microbiology, UNC Chapel Hill. Her title today will be the majority of the replication content virus in the latent reservoir originates from viruses circulating near the time of ART initiation. I've already broken it. my disclosures. And before I get into the data, I want to quickly thank all of the people um, who have been involved in this study. Ron Swanstrom and Carolyn Williamson are co-PIs in the study. And the study wouldn't be possible without access to the CAPRISA cohort and the help of the CAPRISA clinical and research staff. So the goal of this study is to essentially determine when the latent reservoir is established. Much of what we know about that question has to do with studies in which ART was initiated very early in either SIV-infected macaques or HIV-infected people. And in all of those cases, reservoirs form despite extremely early ART. This has led to the general idea that reservoirs begin forming soon after someone is infected and continue to form throughout untreated infection. We'd like to explore this in a cohort of people who began ART when they were chronically infected. This is the basic experimental design. We're examining samples from nine women enrolled in the CAPRISA acute infection cohort. These women enrolled in this portion of the study um, on average seven weeks post-infection. They were untreated for 4.5 years on average and initiated ART with a CD4 count of 286 on average. We have longitudinal samples from throughout this period of untreated infection. 
They then began art, and they were art treated for an average of 4.9 years. At the end of that 4.9 years, a large blood draw was collected. We isolated resting CD4 positive T cells. Those cells were then stimulated with PHA, cultured in a quantitative viral outgrowth assay, and um, viral outgrowth viral uh, p24 positive viral outgrowth wells were selected in this part of the study the viral outgrowth assay was done by David Margolis and Nancy Archen's group so the goal was to identify when the latent um, replication competent proviruses are seeded into the reservoir in order to do that we used myseq with primer ID to sequence three regions of the HIV genome in the pre-therapy plasma samples. As I mentioned, we had longitudinal samples pre-therapy. And then we used PacBio to generate nearly full-length genome sequences from the quantitative viral outgrowth assay. And this is essentially the key to the study. You can use it for the rest of the talk. So um, the rainbow colors represent sequences and data from pre-therapy and red corresponds to time points in the first year of infection. Blue corresponds to time points um, in the year prior to ART. Pink corresponds to outgrowth sequences, which I often call OGVs, or outgrowth viruses. This is the first phylogenetic tree. I'll be showing um, data from two patients as far as phylogenetic trees go. This is from the C2, C3 region of envelope. And if you start by looking at red, that represents sequences from very early in infection. Over time, you see that there is temporal progression in the emergence of time-specific lineages. Further, you can see that there are 27 outgrowth viruses in pink, and that in general, they cluster with sequences from just before ART, the blue sequences on the tree. This is a phylogenetic tree from the second participant examining the V4, V5 region of envelope, and you see a similar pattern. Early in infection, um, there's very little um, heterogeneity. Over time, you see um, these time-specific lineages emerging, and you can see that the outgrowth sequences are generally clustering with blue sequences, which corresponds to sequences from just before the time of art initiation. This chart essentially summarizes all of the data. So to remind you, we had um, sequences from three regions of the genome. So we constructed three phylogenetic trees per participant. And then for each of the outgrowth viruses, we used a likelihood method of phylogenetic placement in which we calculated the time point in which that outgrowth virus was likely to seed the latent reservoir. And for each of the nine patients, we have a pie chart here. And um, the pie chart shows the distribution of um, when outgrowth viruses were seeded into the reservoir for that participant. And what you'll see is that the distribution ranges from 100% of the outgrowth variants being from the year before ART, all the way down to 17% being from the year before ART. So the percentages in the middle of the pie chart represent the percentage of outgrowth viruses from the year before ART. On average, 72% of outgrowth viruses are seeded in the year prior to ART. Um, I want to point out that while 17% um, is the lowest value we see, it's actually quite an outlier. If you look at the first seven participants, 70%, I mean 60% or more of their outgrowth viruses are in the year prior to ART. So the final participant is very different from the others. So to summarize the data, 72% of the long-lived replication competent HIV reservoir is derived from virus replicating in the year prior to ART. So there's only one published study that has data that's very relevant to this that I'm aware of, which is the Broden um, et al. paper that came out in 2016. They performed a similar type of study, but instead of looking at outgrowth viruses, they actually looked at total DNA sequences, and they saw a similar pattern. I think it's also worth pointing out that yesterday there was a talk presented here um, by Dr. Broom in which she examined four participants and she saw um, 
for three of them, they had a different pattern, which is that their out, not outgrowth, but their reservoir DNA, total reservoir DNA, looking at partial sequences, looked as if it was established at different parts of untreated infection. So what we're seeing is that at this point, there are three studies that have addressed this question. There's my own study looking at replica um, nine women and looking at replication competent variants. There's this Broden paper looking at 10 participants and studying total DNA. And there was a study presented yesterday looking at four participants. Of those 23 women who have, or 23 participants who have been examined, 19 of them display a pattern in which most of the reservoir appears to be derived near the time of art. So this suggests that art initiation triggers formation of much of the long-lived HIV-1 reservoir. So I just want to essentially model um, one factor or one parameter that can contribute to that pattern. So this is a model for two of our patients in which we assume that reservoirs begin forming soon after infection and form continuously throughout untreated infection. And the parameter that we manipulated is how long um, the what is the half-life of infected cells during that period? So what is the half-life of the reservoir prior to ART? If it's long, then we would predict to see that the reservoir would contain variants from throughout untreated infection. However, if it's short, we predict that most of the variants in the reservoir will be from the time near ART. So that's the prediction. If we look at the data for two of our participants, what we see is that the distribution is closer to the short what you would predict if half-life was short than it is the, to what you would predict if the half-life was long. So based on this, we generated two hypotheses about how art may initiate, or may, um, art initiation may trigger formation of the long-lived reservoir. The first hypothesis is that art generates nonspecific changes to the immune system. The, these nonspecific um, decrease in general inflammation with initiation of therapy could promote latency in HIV-infected cells or increase the half-life of latently infected cells. The second hypothesis is that ART generates HIV-specific changes to the immune system. So ART initiation decreases HIV-1 antigen load, thus promoting transition of HIV-specific CD4-positive T cells to a resting state. For the subset of those cells that are recently infected, the virus will transition to a latent state, predicting that much of the reservoir is in HIV-specific cells. So these, these hypotheses generate some exciting potential implications for curing HIV. The first is that manipulating T cells at the time of art initiation may substantially reduce the size of the long-lived reservoir. And the second, specifically if, if much of the reservoir is in HIV-specific cells, is that you could somehow target these populations. However, we certainly acknowledge that um, depleting HIV-specific T cells in general is not a great strategy. With that, I would like to um, return to my acknowledgments and accept any questions. Jeff Lifson, Frederick National Lab. Um, I have to compliment you. Your phylogenetic trees were probably the prettiest I've ever seen, <laughs> but, but, but also a little bit hard to read for detail. And I was just curious on a specific question. Did you have any evidence for expanded clones in any of your patients? Yeah. So um, what we observed is that some patients, we, we didn't sample any expanded clones. In other patients, half of the population was expanded clones. Mm -hmm. When we saw clones, um, for this general analysis to see the proportion of the reservoir from each time point, we only included the clone once. Um, I think this uh, high variance in um, the percentage of clones is similar to what other groups have seen as well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. And I might steal one of your beautiful, you know, rainbow uh, phylogenetic I've got for lots the, of them. <laughs> for the track uh, report. So my question was to the comparison to those patients that have really sequences close to the art initiation and the one that have a more broader. So have you looked at the immune responses? Mm. So because one might hypothesize that you might have more escapes, uh, and the one that have 
Absolutely. In Umbra yeah. So, so we're, that that. we haven't done it yet. Um, however, the Caprisa cohort, we have lots of immune data from this cohort. So we're now trying to merge those different studies to figure out what may have contributed to these patterns. I, um, okay, right here. Ah. So I, I, I second what uh, Lidi just said. So, it, so I have a third hypothesis similar to what Lidi said is that it's not art manipulated anything. It's just that because of the evolution pressure that after years accumulation of the viruses at the end before ART are those that are most fit and have escaped CDA T cells and are most fit in growth kinetics. So I'm wondering if it's just that those that are more fit that will come out. So it's not art doing anything. It's just because they are just more fit. If you grow them out in the growth kinetics, may see them. Well, um, since we have, um, at this point, we have full-length genomes, so we could do um, replication-competent virus fitness assays, um, and we could... SCDA yeah. T-cells to that, by the way. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll put that on my list. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as the uh, uh, reservoir is so dynamic with your slide, do you think that drug resistance may disappear after a long period of time in absence of treatment? Would you repeat the question? If the uh, reservoir is so dynamic and some cell may die and replace by other, do you think that cells that may harbor drug resistance to HIV during early treatment and maybe stop over time may disappear? Because we don't see that clinically, but maybe on long term, uh, resistance may vain due to the dynamics of yeah. reservoir. So if, if you look at, um, so if you sequence viral DNA prior to therapy, um, I'm not sure if drug resistance comes and goes or not. I, I know that once you're on therapy, so if you have resistance at the time of therapy initiation, you can still detect those variants in the DNA. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not aware of studies pre-art that longitudinally screen DNA for the presence of um, resistance. Um, if you know those studies, I would love to, I would love to read more about them. I don't. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it's a concern that if it is so dynamic, some resistance cell harboring resistance virus may be gone. And clinically, yet, we, we don't see that. Yeah. Well, oh, one point, I, I should make two points, I think, that are really, really important. The first is that um, we certainly didn't survey all of the reservoir. We can only sample a small part. So those resistant variants um, could persist as a minor fraction of the reservoir, and if someone stops therapy, they could emerge. So I think that's important. The other is that we were looking at cells that are circulating in the blood. And I think we, we have an important observation about how reservoirs are established there. But we're not sure if that same pattern will hold in the tissues. We're certainly not sure if that same pattern will hold for myeloid lineage cells. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to thank everyone for this session. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, speakers for keeping the time.